I'm Marianne Jolly in Tripoli, and this is Foreign Correspondent. They love me, all my people with me. They love me all. He demanded unquestioning loyalty and used fear and violence to enforce it. They will die to, to protect me, my, my people. But his subjects turned the tables. The fall was spectacular. The end humiliating and swift. Muammar Gaddafi is dead. This was an instant revolution against a pain that has been the, the side for 40 years. With the fall of Gaddafi, many he drove away can now return. It was a dream that has come true for me. Tonight, the homecoming, an exile's emotional and confronting journey, returning to a liberated Libya. <laughs> So, from a very different life forged far away, Mansour El Kikia is coming home. He doesn't like everything he sees, but he's determined to be part of the effort to heal this broken and deeply scarred place. You know, if you want your freedom, you have to spill your blood for it. If somebody gives it to you, it's not freedom. We will not give up. We will not give up. It's either freedom or death. We first met Mansour al Kikia in Washington in March this year. The uprising in Libya was only three weeks old and the international community was yet to act. He'd received a call from his sister-in-law to say Colonel Gaddafi's forces had caught his nephew. He went to Brega to help bring back the wounded, back from the, to the, from, from. Excuse me. To bring the wounded from, from the battlefield. And she said, my son is not better than the sons of so many other mothers. And it's, it's worth it. It was a distressing time for the Libyan exile, so far from home and unable to help his family. He couldn't return. Gaddafi had him as a marked man. He had tried on more than one occasion to kidnap me, so it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, 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 an issue of going back. Gaddafi's response was to use anti-aircraft guns against them. So the academic, who's lived in the United States for 33 years, got on with his work, lecturing his students at San Antonio University in Texas. Sir. And as the Libyan revolution developed, Mansour al Kikia's knowledge and opinions were more and more in demand. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank uh, you for having me. You came a long way. Where you, you are from Libya. Yes, I am from Benghazi, actually. I never gave up. I never, never, never gave up. I never gave up on fighting the regime. If you, if you speak out against me, if you in any way raise a finger against me, you will die. You will die. Wow. You will die. You want to change things. If you can't change with your hand, then change it with your mouth. And I use it to the best of my ability to fight this regime. Nothing is easy, John. Right. This is nation building. Now with the Gaddafi regime ousted, Mansour El Kikia is heading home. He's keen to see how his countrymen are faring and to spend time with the family and friends he's missed for decades. I'll be in touch. All right. yeah, thanks. I never thought I would see this country again. Never. Thank you. It was a dream. It was a dream that has come true for me. A long international flight ends in Cairo, Egypt.
From here, his journey to Libya takes to the road. Benghazi is still two days away. And as the minivan heads through the streets of Cairo, past the pyramids and out into the Sahara Desert, there's time to catch up with a fellow traveller. A cousin, Najib al Kikia, is also heading home. He grew up in Tripoli and, like Mansour, has a fractured relationship with the country, leaving 35 years ago and unable to return until after the revolution. I've known Najib all his life. I've known him since he was a year old. I used to carry him up my shoulders. Their decades spent in the US together have only strengthened their bond. I protested, I went to meetings, and did a lot against Gaddafi. It's camels, yeah. It's camels, man. It's camels. <laughs> Eventually, Najib and Mansour roll into Libya's eastern province, Serenaka, the heartland of the opposition. Gaddafi was the spark that started it. But the opposition is throughout this whole region. The people from this region, and particularly its capital, Benghazi, had long been a thorn in Colonel Gaddafi's side. They resisted his rule, and he retaliated by imprisoning thousands of them. But on the 17th of February, the fight back began. Benghazi became a battleground for the future of Libya. Locals drawing inspiration from popular uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt and deciding enough was enough. And so, and so once, once the revolution started, there was a tremendous fight back against the regime's identity. And what and what and those who identified with the regime, and you can see it in the burnt buildings, burnt houses, and so forth. Light fades as Mansour and Nijib arrive in Benghazi. Family are out on the street, waiting to welcome them home. <laughs> It's an emotional gathering. But ahead are some confronting encounters as the past collides with the present. Mansour al Kikia may have spent much of his life away from his homeland, but the attachments endure. And here, not far from where his family now lives, memories come flooding back. I always remember the serenity in this house. And I felt very bad when we left it. And this is the same Yeah, but this is where he spent his childhood. In 1978, the Gaddafi regime seized it from the family for public use. It's now a museum. This used to be a, a room called the, the, the coal room. The coal, yeah. The coal room, OK? There's a coal, and there's the other room next to it had, uh, had wood. You remember the cooking house? Yeah. You don't, you the al yeah. are a political yeah. dynasty, and their house has rich historic value. There's a banana plant right over there. It's gone. Mansour's father was a pasha, a high-ranking political figure during the Ottoman era. And when Libya gained independence in 1951, he became the first prime minister of Serenaka. I never really knew him very well. I was, I mean, he had me when he was 70 years old. I've known him more, less as a father and more as a, as a figure of history. Mansour's cousin, also named Mansour al Kikia, is perhaps the best known of the political clan. He was Libya's foreign minister in the early 70s, but he resigned when the regime began to imprison and kill political dissidents. Eventually, like his namesake, 
He was forced to leave the country and he too became one of Libya's most prominent human rights activists. But in 1993, when he was in Egypt attending an international conference, he was abducted and never seen again. So we know the Egyptian government was responsible for abducting him from his hotel. They handed him over to the Libyan security services as a gift. Well, he was, uh, he was like my father. And we were so close. Felt so sad when he passed away. The politician turned dissident never lived to see a defining battle erupt in the heart of his city. This was Gaddafi's compound in Benghazi. It was here that the battle for liberation began. Thousands of locals with no guns in their possession climbed the fortified fences and took on the heavily armed guards. With cars, heavy machinery and homemade bombs, they finally brought down the wall. 375 died, most of them in their 20s. I was very proud of them because, you know, all, in all honesty, they fought against bullets with bare chests. That's what they did. Bare chests, they had no guns. This was an instant revolution against a pain that has been on their side for 40 years. The fire had started and eventually the uprising fanned out across the country towards the capital Tripoli, the centre of Gaddafi's power base. They love me, all my people with me, they love me all. They, they, they will die to, to protect me, my, my people. إصابات خطيرة في اللمولة فين وفي اللي ما يقدروش اللمو في اللي نعدوا الموقع أنا يقول مطرتشين ما في شيء ما عندك متلم أطراف مرة مشيت لفوضية فوضية فوضية ويجي تمي راجو فيا راجو فيا راجو فيا وأنا كشفي ما نعرف سالم بكاتو is a scout leader and knows all about Gaddafi's authority in Tripoli he's got the scars and bruises to prove it مسكونا غادي عندي العياده اللي بس كشفي نفس اللي بس هذا نزلونا شرطونا دبشنا سرقونا سالم is Mansour al Kikia's nephew the young man who was helping bring wounded from the front lines when he went missing feared dead in the opening weeks of the revolution instead he was captured tortured taken to the capital and imprisoned ضربونا على الكراينه فلقه شكفت ردوني شيلي اللي ما قدرش نمشي اربع ايام قعدت ما نمشي تخفوا في الشيش اللي يكب البول عليهم انطونا عيونا كتفونا ونزلونا مع الممر حطونا في شيء اللي بدوا فينا ضرب بالواحد نزلوا تمشي مرات تقريبا تاع 10 متر ومصابين على اليمين وعلى اليسار تتمشي وما يضربوا فيك بوتيجي تجري تمشي يجي يضرب ولعند تخش الدار وما يضرب ما نقدرش ما توقعناش روحنا نروحوا احيا Salem was detained for almost 7 months ending up in Tripoli's most notorious prison Abu Salim when the revolution took hold in the capital, he and the other inmates were freed. He arrived home to his family in Benghazi in August to a hero's welcome. It seems that um, his luck is with um, the, our prayers. I don't know. He came back. When he came back, we were very happy. <laughs> Shake hands with me. <laughs> I'm like, 
كل واحد يسلم كل واحد شو اخبارك؟ الله يسلم خلينا نشوف يا الله يحبك الله يسلم ترو هي از لينكت تو مي باي بلاد اند ترو ذات اي كير اباوت هيم برابس مور ذان اي كير اباوت اذرز بات ذا هول اونست تروث از ذات تو مي هي از نو ديفرنت فروم ماني اوف ذا اذرز هو دايد The horrors of Abu Salim prison are shared by so many throughout the country. أنا طبعا طبعا للأسف زمان كنا كنا في الجيش يعني أي ديفي في الجيش فطبعا نحن رفضنا أمر فأول مرة حكموا علينا بالإعدام بعدين حكموا علينا بسبع سنين Artist Ali El Wakwak was in Abu Salim prison in the 1980s and now occupies a very different but still very chilling space the Museum of Gaddafi Crimes. يعني تو الناس كلها تحرر طبعا وطبعا كل واحد يعبر بطريقة ثانية الرسام كل واحد الشاعر القاسم الصحفي والله شوي تو ما ما نقدرش نعبر لك يعني ما فيش بعد كي احلى حاجه يعني ما فيش بعد كي الواحد يعبر بيه شعور غير عادي Signs of exuberance and liberation are everywhere in Benghazi. Such a dramatic change of mood in such a short time. When we were last in Libya for foreign correspondent in 2004, nobody could say anything about Gaddafi. If they did, they'd be likely to be killed or imprisoned. But now the walls of the cities are covered in caricatures. monthly magazine yeah so he wants to make it bigger but just every month exactly about 36 pages <laughs> and the freedom of expression extends to the news media and the people covering the dramatic changes in libya ultimately believe me you will be a beacon in 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 the new libya you know the libyan times is a new magazine funded by a benghazi businessman it's published in English and is challenging the status quo, with women taking up prominent roles on staff. Like, for most people, they're saying, like, why is that women can, like, be a prime minister or something? It's not impossible. This is an important thing. Sundas El Shemaini contributed a harrowing story to the first edition. A story about her father. It was too dangerous for her to hear during the Gaddafi years. Sundas's mother, Marada El Shemaini, couldn't tell her even in the privacy of her own home. I only knew that he wasn't present. And they always, uh, they always telling me that, like, for a politics reasons or something like that. Abdul Aziz El Shemaini's photo now hangs, along with hundreds of other Benghazians, on the wall of martyrs here in Freedom Square. We are uh, feeling so sad. Even now, Sundas and her mother can't be precisely sure why he was imprisoned but they're certain his religious devotion had a lot to do with it. Was he actually sentenced or charged for anything? No, at all. Nobody, nobody discussed what the problem, what's the problem, what they want to. Just keep them inside. Nobody knew why, you know. Gaddafi targeted many devout Muslims on the pretext they were a security threat. Gaddafi, like, always thinks they're Qaeda, they're terrorist people, they're, like, doing bad things and stuff, but they weren't. In so many ways, Abu Salim prison in Tripoli was the epicentre of Gaddafi's reign of terror. 
Mansour El Kikia decides he needs to see it for himself. Located on the outskirts of the capital, in what was a Gaddafi stronghold, the prison was liberated in August when the city fell to the transitional government. There's a third wall inside there too. Tens of thousands were locked up here for their political stance and many simply for their religious beliefs. They were never tried, nor sentenced. Okay? They were just kept in limbo. And that's what the regime does, keeps you in limbo. Many former inmates and their families are now wandering the corridors trying to make sense of it all. He has spent in this prison 14 years and he has spent in this prison for 12 years. His crime, his crime was that he did not inform on his neighbour. Over the decades, resentment and anger at the gross injustices grew. But it was one particular event within these walls 15 years ago that would sow the seeds for the eventual overthrow of the dictatorship. This, this government, two brother and son, is, is they, one is killed here. Killed yeah. here, yes. When was he killed? In uh, 1996. In yeah. the massacre? Yeah. Yes. yes. In this courtyard in 1996, 1,200 people were slaughtered because they protested about the conditions. That massacre was a catalyst to the current uprising. The vast majority of those killed were from Benghazi. One of them was Sundus El Shemani's father. The regime did not tell the families of, of those whom it killed until about 10 years later. In February this year, families of victims of the 1996 massacre took to the streets of Benghazi to protest the arrest of a lawyer who was seeking justice for them. Hundreds of others joined as they moved along. They weren't asking for much, or they're asking for, please, open up the system. Enough is enough. The response they got was bullets and it killed many, many people. The regime's violent response to the protesters would bring on its undoing. Benghazians stormed Gaddafi's compound and the dominoes started to fall. <laughs> After 42 years of repression and a bloody eight-month rebellion, Libyans have finally got rid of the dictator. Colonel Gaddafi is no more. But now the real work begins, building a new unified nation, and it's daunting. My major concern is laying solid foundations for institutions. Because Libya had very weak institutions, Mr Gaddafi was able to take it over very quickly. Power struggles between rivaling eastern and western regions are beginning to emerge. And Islamic hardliners, many of whom played defining roles in the rebellion, are causing dangerous tensions within the new civilian government. Libyans do not want a theocracy, they want a democracy. We're not Saudi Arabia, we're not Iran, we're not Afghanistan, we never were. In Tripoli, hundreds of armed rebel fighters from outside the capital who helped to liberate it are yet to return home. And some of them are mounting revenge attacks on those associated with the old regime. It's not a deliberate policy of the council to torture or to seek revenge. The policy that the council is pursuing is the policy of national reconciliation. Now, the council is not able to, to rein in some of those individuals who are committing these atrocities, I understand. You know? But what can the council do? It doesn't, ha it doesn't have an army of its own. Despite the difficulties ahead, 
For Mansour, Nijib and their families, nothing can douse their hope for a brighter future. Right now, they're relishing the freedom of being able to sit and talk face to face after so many years. It was neat, you know, there's a, a lot of family members that I never met. And uh, when I came back, they all have kids and it was pretty nice. So do you feel as though you've missed a lot? Well, you know, personally, yes, but when you think about your uh, nation, your family, you know, it's part of sacrifice. You know, you feel like a dream came true. And sometimes, you know, you don't get to see the end of the dream, so it's just, it's pretty neat. <laughs> I see a tremendous amount of problems. But on the other hand, you know, uh, I think they're not insurmountable. I'm optimistic, I can't afford to be but optimistic. <laughs> It's only now that the Libyans are beginning to feel comfortable with the freedom that they've, that they've gotten. And uh, they have done the, the impossible by removing this, this ogre. And they have given us back hope. They have given us back our lives. <laughs> Just a couple of months ago, Salem Benkato was languishing in Abu Salim prison, wondering if he'd survive. Now he's out in the sunshine, full of hope for a Libya freed from the grip of Muammar Gaddafi.